The 890s, the final years of the reign of Alfred the Great. After a period of relative tranquility, major Viking attacks resumed in England. King Alfred's extensive military reforms would be put to the test as three large Viking armies simultaneously invaded the territories of Wales, Mercia, and Wessex. Wisdom is the highest virtue, and it has within it four other virtues. One is caution, the second moderation, the third courage, and the fourth justice. Wisdom renders those who love it wise and honorable, and temperate, and patient, and just, and it fills him who loves it with every good quality. This is from Alfred the Great's translation of the Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. The king spent this period bolstering the military defenses of his kingdom, as well as reading and translating the works of thinkers like Boethius. Alfred sought to instill wisdom not only in himself, but in his subjects as well. He knew that his people needed to be strong not only in body, but in mind and spirit. Alfred also spent this period strengthening bonds with his neighbor, Mercia. The crown of Wessex had deep ties to the Mercians, Alfred was married to a Mercian lady, Ellsworth, and she'd brought with her many family members and clerics from her homeland. Historians have long noted that the 880s and 890s particularly saw Alfred's court filled with Mercians. It was at this time that Athelred, Lord of the Mercians, became a fixture at the court of Wessex, joining the king on numerous military campaigns. The two rulers got to know one another well, both on the warpath and in the council chamber. Alfred arranged for his eldest daughter, Athelflaed, to marry the valiant young Lord of Mercia. By the time Athelflaed set off for Mercia in 886 to begin her life as a married woman, she was already well acquainted with her husband Athelred and confident that unity of purpose existed between him and her father. Athelflaed and her brother Edward would carry forward Alfred's dynasty. As children, they were educated in the rich literary traditions of the Anglo-Saxons, the heroic poetry that had thrilled Alfred as a youngster would have also been inculcated in the young Athelflaed and Edward. This instilled in them a sense of the majesty of their own royal line. Bishop Asser tells us of Alfred's legendary ancestry, which even included ancient Germanic Scandinavian gods like Odin. Alfred's younger children and other Anglo-Saxon youngsters would benefit from an even more extensive education with the establishment of Alfred's royal school. Here, scholars taught classical Latin texts meant to edify young Anglo-Saxons with high wisdom. Despite these enlightened pursuits, Saxon domains remained harried by violence. Even after 878, Viking raids still continued to be a problem for Alfred's kingdom, though on a mostly small scale. Guthrum, the Danish king of East Anglia, had been a quiet neighbor since his defeat at Eddington, content to abide by his treaty with Alfred. But in 890, Guthrum died, and this created an opening for other, more ambitious adventurers. Vikings who had been active on the continent since 879 suffered a major defeat at the Battle of the River Dial in 891. A famine the following year drove them to return to the coast of Flanders. From there, they struck at England, landing on the coast and attempting to penetrate a sparsely defended, thickly forested area known as the Great Wood. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recounts this attack of 892. In this year, the great Viking army came up the estuary of the Lyman with 250 ships. This estuary is in eastern Kent, at the east end of the Great Wood. The wood from east to west is 120 miles long or longer and 30 miles wide. The river flows out of that forest. They rowed their ships up the river as far as the forest, four miles from the outer part of the estuary, and there they attacked a fortification located in the marshland. A few commoners were present inside, and it was only half made. Then shortly afterwards, Hastein came up the Thames estuary with 80 ships and made a fortification for himself at Milton and the other Viking army, made one at Appledore. This passage captures the brilliance of the Viking strategy. 
two separate naval forces penetrated the kingdom by river at a remote, heavily forested location, overcoming light local resistance and establishing two separate bases. The army, as the chronicler noted, was under the leadership of Hastine, a charismatic Norse adventurer who would replace Guthrum as King Alfred's arch-opponent. Hastine's backstory has all the makings of a Viking legend. He'd previously raided in Spain and North Africa, and even attempted an attack on Rome. Now, he had his sights set on Wessex. The Chronicle describes how Alfred handled this sudden assault. And then King Alfred assembled his army and advanced so that he encamped between the two Viking armies at a point where he had the best access both to the forest stronghold at Appledore and the river stronghold at Milton, so that he could reach either one if they chose to make for any open country. Then the Vikings set out afterwards through the forest in small bands and riding companies along whatever side was undefended by the English army. And they were also pursued by other troops almost every day, either by day or by night, both from the English army and also from the boroughs. Alfred's intention was to prevent the Danes from freely raiding throughout his kingdom or from breaking out of their forts. He dispatched his own raiding parties to harass both Viking armies and to intercept their communications. We can see now the benefits of Alfred's burl system. Neither Danish army could move about as it wished. Everywhere they went, they were confronted by strong local forces, and the towns were well defended. Easy plunder was scarcely to be found. After a few months, Alfred opened negotiations with Hastine. Accompanied by Lord Athelred, the king met with the Viking leader, and the two parties agreed to terms. Hastine swore to depart the kingdom and offered hostages. Two of these hostages were Hastine's own sons. Both were baptized, with Alfred and Athelred acting as their godfathers. The Chronicle even tells us that Alfred paid the Vikings, quote, a good deal of money. It seems unbelievable that the victor of Eddington would return to the hated old practice of paying Danegeld, and yet this appears to be exactly what happened. In assessing this moment in Alfred's career, we should consider the dangerous situation he was facing. His victory at Eddington had been a close-run affair, and indeed he'd nearly lost his kingdom. Now, for the first time in years, two powerful Viking forces were on his doorstep. Alfred was surely nervous about the prospect of another existential crisis for Wessex. Perhaps he decided to try for an easy solution and see if he could convert Hastine to another Guthrum. Post-878, Guthrum's rule in East Anglia had been mostly stabilizing for Wessex. By having Guthrum's son baptized, the king may have hoped to recreate such a favorable situation. As it turned out, Alfred would be disappointed. Hastine crossed the Thames, settled with his army at Benfleet in Essex, and at once resumed pillaging Alfred's lands. At Easter of 893, the other, larger Viking army at Appledore set off in their ships to join Hastine at Essex. Alfred was preparing to set out against the enemy when the worst possible news arrived. In the weeks after Easter, a third Viking army composed of Danes from Northumbria and East Anglia landed at Exeter. Alfred set off to meet this new invasion while his son, Prince Edward, marched to confront the Appledore Vikings. Although he was only about 20 years old, Edward was expected to lead troops in the field. The Chronicle of Elderman Athelward recounts the battle that followed. And after Easter of that year, the Viking army, which had arrived from Gaulish parts, broke camp, and by following the hiding places of a certain vast forest, which is commonly called the Great Wood, they got as far as western England and devastated the provinces thereabout. These matters were made known to Prince Edward, the son of King Alfred. He had been conducting a campaign throughout the southern parts of England, but afterward he was joined by the western English. The engagement took place at Farnham, with the dense throng shrieking with threats. Without delay, the young men attacked with weapons. They were duly liberated by the prince's arrival. The Viking leader was wounded, and the Saxons drove the filthy crowds of his supporters across the River Thames to northern parts. Thus young Edward won his first battle. The Saxons recovered a great deal of booty, and the Vikings fled to Thorny Island. Here, Edward besieged the enemy in their campsite. However, Edward ran into a serious problem. 
The levies under his command were running short of provisions and nearing the end of their terms of service. They grumbled at the prospect of a long siege. Many of these men were due to return to their garrison assignments at various boroughs. The situation was saved by the arrival of Lord Athelred with a Mercian army from London. Edward and Athelred opened negotiations and the Vikings agreed to depart the area. Athelred now further demonstrated his capabilities. Leading a combined force of Mercians and West Saxons, he surprised Hastine at his base of Benfleet. The Chronicle provides a memorable account of this battle. And then the English arrived and put the Viking army to flight and stormed the fortification and seized everything that was inside in the way of goods, women and children as well. And they brought everything to London, and then they either broke up or burned all the ships, and Hastine's two sons and his wife were brought to the king. Hastine's fortress was destroyed at Benfleet, but he managed to slip away with most of his men. This was the Norseman's most remarkable talent, making him an enduring thorn in the side of the Anglo-Saxons. Hastine established a new fortified camp at Shubury. Then he made a dash across England for the Welsh borders to establish camp at Buddington in the Welsh hills. This was a remarkable trek across hostile territory in which the Vikings managed to avoid detection by Saxon garrisons, a testament to the mobility and effectiveness of the Norsemen. Also, this placed Hastine very near to the Northumbrian East Anglian Viking army confronting King Alfred at Exeter. But as Hastine began pillaging Wales, the Northumbrian East Anglian invaders suddenly abandoned their position and returned home. Alfred's operations had been effective. The Vikings simply realized that they would not be able to make any headway with the royal army in the field. This development eased pressures on the Anglo-Saxons. Now Lord Athelred organized for a decisive strike against Hastine. He was joined by two important West Saxon eldermen, Athelm of Somerset and Athelm of Wiltshire, as well as substantial Welsh contingents. Mercia and Wales had often been at odds, but fear of the Vikings brought them together now in a firm alliance. For weeks, the Anglo-Welsh coalition besieged Hastine's Vikings at Buddington. Unable to dispatch foraging parties, the Danes quickly began to starve and were reduced to eating their horses. Hastine decided to attempt to break out across the river. This resulted in a bloody battle. Casualties were high on both sides. Danish losses were higher. Ultimately, the Anglo-Saxons and their Welsh allies were victorious. Characteristically, Hastine and many of his men managed to escape, but this was the end of the Viking leader's legendary career. His forces retreated into East Anglia, and from there Hastine disappears from history. We can't be sure of his fate, but it's possible that he simply retired. By now, he was probably in his 50s and a wealthy man after a lifetime of raiding across France and the Mediterranean. Thus, as 893 drew to a close, Alfred the Great and his allies had defeated a dangerous opponent, though not without months of hard fighting. This demonstrated the effectiveness of Alfred's military reforms. The Saxons had been unable to prevent the Vikings from penetrating their territory, but Alfred's system of forts had seriously hindered Viking movement and dramatically reduced opportunities for plunder. Villagers found refuge in the fortified boroughs, and local levies effectively harassed and pursued Danish raiding parties. Far from the lucrative expeditions of the past, the Vikings found this war to be grueling, leaving them with little but battle wounds to show for their trouble. By now, Alfred was an old man and took a less active role in the campaigning. His son-in-law, Athelred of Mercia, provided crucial leadership in some of the most difficult fighting, and the king's son and heir, Edward, also proved his worth. The West Saxons cooperated smoothly with the Mercians, and the Welsh as well, and multiple Christian armies moved to where they were needed throughout the crisis. At the same time, the situation revealed limitations in the Anglo-Saxon military establishment. Prince Edward nearly saw his victory at Farnham collapse into defeat when his troops threatened to disperse because they had nearly completed their period of service and were running low on provisions. One also might question the continued tendency to negotiate with Viking forces. In acknowledging the shortcomings of Alfred's armies, we must also take into account the remarkable competence of their opponents. These Vikings were no disorganized plunderers, but highly efficient, swift, and elusive invasion units. The Danes continued to make good use of the waterways, often evading Saxon counteroffensives. 
Hastein himself was the sort of daring commander to inspire the best in his men and to be a persistent irritant to Alfred and his followers. Hastein was out of the picture, but Alfred's final showdown with the Vikings wasn't yet over. In our next episode on Viking England, we'll look at the final years of King Alfred's reign.